So let's start with the show. How's the show going? All right. Yeah, let's do this. Yeah, the show is done. It's in the stage of post-production where they uh, take like the wire out of the stuntman, whoever it is, he gets pulled from the explosion, um, take, scrubs the house out of the hillside that shouldn't be there or something, yeah. you know, things like that. The things that are expensive that you don't want to put time into unless it's in the, the final cut. It's the locked cut of the episode. So once that's in that stage, then they can go in and pull those wires out, scrub them out, and do that sort of a thing. Crazy. Um, do the treatments and do all that stuff that you wouldn't want to do just to waste it on things that aren't going to make it into that final cut. So um, yeah, it's coming out uh, this summer. Summer, July 1st, and uh, slowly drop in the first look, which is about 15, 20 seconds, and then the teaser, which I think is about a minute, and then the trailer, which is about two minutes. So those will get uh, dropped out here over the next uh, next few months in the lead up to, uh, to July 1st. Wild. Crazy. Yeah, Crazy. ever in, in your life, do you, did you think you'd be helping making a show? Yeah. You yeah, did? I did? Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, uh, growing up, you know, I, I knew, hey, SEAL team, I'm going to the military, I'm going to serve my country. Uh, then after that, I'm going to write thrillers. Uh, and that's because I was reading guys like Tom Clancy and David Morrell and A.J. Quinnell, Mark Golden, these guys in the 80s who had protagonists uh, that had backgrounds, typically in Vietnam back then. So me as a 10-year-old kid, 11-year-old kid, 12-year-old kid, um, I'm reading like, you know, Nelson DeMille book or whatever and seeing, oh, this guy has experience in Vietnam and special operations. Uh, and the books were typically like that. Um, and so I knew that, hey, one day I'm going to write these kind of novels. And so as I was getting out of the military, it uh, I didn't have to search too far to find that next passion because I knew what it was. It was writing. Yeah. Um, so I started doing that my last about year and a half in the military, started uh, to write the first novel, and then sent it to New York about uh, four months after I got out, and uh, we went to the races. But uh, but Chris got it, Chris Pratt got it in, a no, uh, my sense of, a buddy called actually, and uh, from the SEAL teams I hadn't talked to in about five years, mm -hmm. about four months before the first book came out, and uh, first he asked if I remembered him, which I did, <laughs> then he asked, uh, hey, do you remember what you did for me in the SEAL teams? And I did not. And uh, he said, hey, you, you're the only person that, uh, as I was getting out, sat me down, talked to me about transition, introduced me to people in the private sector. Uh, no one else cared enough to do that. And I've always remembered it and always wanted to thank you. Awesome. And uh, I was like, hey, no problem. And then he said, uh, I heard you have a book coming out. And I said, yeah, I can send you a rough draft copy thing. And uh, he said, I'd like that, but I'd like to give it to a friend of mine. And I said, no problem, who's that? And he said, Chris Pratt. Wild. Which is crazy because I thought of Chris Pratt playing the role as I was writing it. And this is before he was in Guardians of the Galaxy, before the Avengers, before Jurassic World. He was on Parks and Rec, and then he had a small role as a SEAL in Zero Dark Thirty. And you'd already thought of him? I thought, this is the guy. Yep. As, uh, he's likable on and off camera. I think I read somewhere that he was, you know, uh, pro-military or a kind of a guy's guy. Yeah. Um, and uh, I thought, this is this is who's going to star. And then I'm like, Antoine Fuqua is going to direct it, um, even though I had no connections to either of them as I was yeah. writing. Uh, and then I knew my publisher would be Emily Bessler at Simon & Schuster. And, uh, but I had no connections anywhere to any of that. I just thought that's, gonna, that's how it's going to happen. And that's about all the bandwidth I spent worried about that side of it. And then everything else went into the book. Wow, the vision is crazy. That's wild. Yeah, I'm lucky that I knew what I wanted to do early on. Yeah. Uh, and didn't have to kind of search for it. I didn't get out of the military and then say, oh, what am I going to do? Yeah. Since I was a little kid, both of the things that I wanted to do in life. So I always thought, and then kid in the 80s, you think you write something, and of course it's going to get picked up by an A-list star, and they're going to make it into this big thing. And uh, so that's just what I what I thought, naively. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, hey, I didn't, didn't spend any time worried about it not happening. Were you writing rough draft or like smaller novels before that? Nope, nope. I was a fan first, so growing up reading all these, uh, I was reading all that fiction, but at the same time I was reading anything non-fiction side that I could find on warfare, special operations, terrorism, insurgencies, counterinsurgencies, that sort of a thing. So I've always been a student of warfare, and then by default, really a student of the genre, of the thriller genre, just because I was a reader. Mm -hmm. And then my mom introduced me to um, uh, Joseph Campbell, who wrote here with a Thousand Faces in uh, 1988 through a series of interviews he did with Bill Moyers on PBS called The Power of Myth. And uh, I've never forgotten uh, what was in the, those specials. And then I read the book. And then I kind of looked at every book that I read and every movie that I saw or every series that I saw through that lens of Joseph Campbell's Hero with a Thousand Faces. So all that kind of laid a foundation for me to do what I'm doing now, which is write these novels. Crazy. Yeah. So tell us, how, how has Hollywood been different than being an author? What's going on over there? Yeah, so 
I didn't know what to expect, obviously, because I didn't, uh, you know, come up through like the ranks as an assistant and then this or around Hollywood at all. I had no idea what to expect other than what I've seen in movies. Um, kind of same thing with my agent. Like I had no idea I needed an agent first and then I found out I did. <laughs> and then my only vision of what an agent was came from from Hollywood, like Californication, you know, that sort of a thing. Yeah. Like David Duchovny, you know, I and his friend. Um, so I didn't really, didn't really know. But same thing with every part of Hollywood. I didn't know what it was like on a set or how all this stuff worked, what a writer's room was. Um, so to be part of the process from its inception all the way through now, post-production and then into getting it out there, the marketing, the advertising side of it is, uh, has been really, really cool to be a part of that because usually they like to get rid of the author right away because they don't want the author on set going, you ruined my vision. You know, they just, they, that's the, usually the experience that directors and actors have when they adapt something. Yeah. Um, and, but uh, Antoine and Chris wanted me involved from the very beginning and they understood that, hey, I, I get it. I get that this is not going to be exactly the same as the book, just like the book First Blood written by David Morrell in 1972. Never been out of print, by the way. This is the 50th anniversary of that. Um, but uh, the movie and that book are very different, but they're both awesome. Yeah. So I knew that, hey, you're telling a story visually. It's not going to be exactly the same. So um, for people that are you know, more cynical or kind of the glass half empty type of people, they're, they're going to watch it with the book in hand and be like, oh, no, that's different. That's different. That's different. Oh, it's horrible. You know, that's that, that's one way to go. Yeah. <laughs> or you can sit down and be like, oh, man, this is this is awesome. Let's, let's go on this journey. Let's see how it's different. Mm -hmm. uh, and what's cool about it being a little different is that if you are a, a fan of the novels, uh, particularly the first book, uh, there'll be some surprises in that's there. Cool. So you can go in with a kind of, kind of like open mind. Yeah. And what we kept really and what was important to Chris and Antoine and me was that, hey, we keep the the, the dark raw, visceral violence, that grittiness, that authenticity piece. And so that was what was important to, to them. And so that's what um, what we've kept really as the base yeah. of everything. And other few things shift. But there's uh, if you are a fan of the book, there'll be some cool cool things in there that we get thrown that get thrown in uh, gear wise. Yeah. Um, and usually, you know, in Hollywood, people pay for product placement. There's none of that. Awesome. In this. It was all just totally organic. Okay. And some things are different just because they couldn't get certain things so like they had to do the best that they could yeah. um but the prop uh, prop master was awesome uh he's a third generation prop master in hollywood uh everybody was just incredible so they did the best they could with that side of it and, I, and i'm super happy with wow. it so some things might be a little different here and there but there'll be some awesome stuff as well like uh yeah i don't want to give too much away but um i'll leave it to, uh, leave it to the viewer to to pick out all those things that uh yeah that are that, that tie into the book what a crazy journey. Yeah, it's crazy. But also Hollywood side of the house, uh, it's a lot like a military operation. I didn't expect that. Mm -hmm. So the first day I walked onto set for that first first episode, and I immediately noticed how similar it is to the military in that everyone is so good at their specific jobs. Mm -hmm. um, so like in the platoon, you know, you have your medic and your armorer and, you know, your breacher and all that sort of sniper, free fall people, like that sort of a thing. Um, same thing on set. Like you had you had craft food services because you got to feed the army. Yeah. And so that's their job. Um, you had the armorer and that's just like in a SEAL platoon. He's like, he's checking out the weapons, checking them back in. Um, yeah, you have your explosives experts, like we have a breacher in a platoon when they do the explosions and get that stuff going. Yeah. Um, the mobility guys, just like in, in a platoon, you have your mobility people that are getting the cars all ready to go they're getting the, the routes in there and all that sort of a thing um, same thing on set you have the uh, mobility people that are in charge of all the vehicles sourcing the vehicles building them up that sort of thing so get the land cruiser in there from the book which is pretty pretty cool um, but uh, but very similar and then you have Antoine Fuqua director is like he's like the commanding officer and he's mm -hmm. setting that tone kind of strategically up here and then you have Chris who's the uh, uh, kind of platoon commander troop commander and he is setting that tone tactically so it was it was really cool to see that because I can I can see how it could go a little crazy if you had a director that was insane yeah. and then an actor that was like a lead actor that was just kind of yeah, yeah. Um, I can see how things could be really miserable and this was the exact opposite and so many people came by this thing it's called Video Village okay. and it's like all well, the executive producers are set up and we have our chairs and our screens and, and all, you can listen to what's going on and all that stuff and so many people would come by uh, like the hair makeup person she'd come by and say my my, my cousin is going to boot camp tomorrow. Uh, can you sign a book? Yeah, like that sort of yeah. thing. Or somebody comes, somebody else comes by, like one of the, like a, a teamster comes by and is like, hey, my, uh, you know, my son's going to his first deployment as a Marine tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, that sort of a thing. Um, so people would come by and the other executive producers were like, this doesn't usually happen. Usually people kind of stay away from this area. That's and people would come by, they wanted to talk 
they want to talk guns, they want to talk knives, they want to talk land cruisers, they want to talk motorcycles, <laughs> they want to talk hunting. You know, there was like, you know, yeah. normal Americans um, that are exactly, that are yeah. just there doing the best job they can um, with their specific uh, task. And man, they're so good. And I see why it has to be that way because you have these enormous budgets. I mean, you have these like crazy explosions, you have all this stuff going on. And if you're not the best or if you're doing too much, mm -hmm. so now I kind of get it when you hear people talk about uh, the unions and how you're not allowed to plug something in if it's not your job. Yeah. Now I get it because yeah. if you're being told to do something, it's not your job and you're about to have the huge explosion go off over here and you're supposed to be on the safety side, like you have to be doing, and it makes things, it's like a Lamborghini. Yeah. Like when it's running great type of it, I think. Yeah. Uh, when it's running great, awesome every part yeah. perfect type of a thing um you know but if that one person is doing something else or not there ding, 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 you know like it needs to go to the mechanic yeah so it's uh so it's a finely tuned racing machine uh and that's how they that's how they get this stuff done that's awesome it's yeah. great you had such a good hollywood experience yeah it was really cool it was really cool but my other takeaways are that hey i'm so surprised that anything gets made in hollywood and the other surprise is that hey uh, anything good gets made in Hollywood because there are so many opportunities for things to go off the rails or to, to lose that authenticity piece or to mess something up. So now I'm much more forgiving when I watch uh, a show or movie today. I'm like, okay, I, I know how much work went into this and I know how easy it is to mess something up. Uh, so I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm much more forgiving. Yeah, I, was, I was forgiving before, but I'm even more so now. Yeah. Were you on uh, Overwatch for every episode? Nope, I went out, f uh, so filmed from March to August of 2021, and I was out there uh, five times for a week each, four or five times for a week each. Um, so I tried, I wanted to get out there and say, so we have different directors for each episode. Antoine did the first one, and he's like overarching you know, editing and all that sort of a thing. Um, but I wanted to get out there and say thank you to each individual director, and some of them uh, did two episodes, so I um, wanted to get out there and just shake their hands and say say thank you for, yeah. for taking this project on. I wanted to say hi to, uh, and thank you to all the, the actors and, and that sort of a thing. So we had a yeah great crew. Everybody was just awesome. That's phenomenal. Yeah. It's going to be awesome to see it come out. Yeah. Yeah, my friend Jared Shaw, he trains, he's, a, he's, the, he's the guy who called me and gave the book to Chris, so he's the guy that made all this happen. Uh -huh. And he, uh, he, he's in the show as a boozer, he, so he plays a character really? in the show. He's a producer on it. It would be a totally different show if he had not been involved, and he did way more than he was, uh, he was supposed to do. And, and he was there for the technical advising, he was there for, with our friend Ray Mendoza, also a SEAL, who's in there doing technical advising. Um, and without those guys there each and every single day, it would be a, be a different show. Yeah. Uh, they just took so much care with it and um, yeah, forever grateful to those guys. Um, but Jared also trains Chris up for a lot of these uh, roles. Really? Yeah. So on the fitness side of the house, he gets, uh, he gets Chris in shape, keeps, him on, awesome. keeps him on the path. Yeah. So. <laughs> I need to meet that guy. Yeah. No, yeah. He's awesome. That's he's sweet. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's insane that Chris got the script and went for it just in terms of other projects you hear about where someone's pitching it and pitching it and pitching it finally trying to get it picked up but the way that it organically just got in chris's hand and he loved it and you'd already been thinking out of him that's Crazy. just insane yeah i was on a call on friday with a uh another hollywood director who's uh, uh just having a conversation talking about some future projects and uh, he was asking how this all came about and he's been involved in the He's been in the 30 years doing this sort of thing with these huge, huge movies. And, and he's like, just so you know, this is not how it usually happens in Hollywood. Yeah. I'm like, I know, people keep telling me that. And yeah. so, so anyway, he's, uh, we're kicking around some ideas together, working on, working on maybe for a future project, we'll see. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, let's dive into some fitness topics. Uh, one, of the, one of the things Mountain Tough is working on is a pre-deployment program for active duty military members. It's a project we've been working on for a couple of years, and it's tying into uh, special operations pre-deployment schedules. And so it's around the urgency they feel to be very well prepared for a mission. And we know they're doing a lot um, tactically and logistically to ramp up for deployments, but we're trying to take care of them physically and mentally. And just wanted to pick your brain on what you used to do, what worked, what didn't work, lessons learned around that pre-deployment window. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's evolved so much over time. So I was in for, for 20 years, uh, showed up in my first SEAL team in October of 1997, and really from 1997 until, gosh, I'm gonna say, after September 11th, I'm gonna say 2001, 2002, 
time frame, it was still like 1980 style encyclopedia bodybuilding. Uh, you know, three sets, uh, seven to ten buys, tries, back. You know, like that sort of a thing. Yeah. Um, it was like that, and then run as far as you can, as fast as you can in the sand. Like that's just what you did. Uh, and the gym was about the size of this room, uh, maybe a little bigger, twice the size of this room, and it was like jailhouse. You know, on the beach, everything's rusted. Um, uh, I mean, it's a room, but you're getting that sand's blowing in, and it was an old, I mean, it was, it's been around for a long, long time. Um, and uh, so, so we, we had, we didn't evolve really along with the, the red, the, the private sector evolved quicker than we did in the SEAL teams, in the military in, in general, I would say. Um, so we were definitely stuck in the 80s as far as that that went, just bulking up, you know, deployment then, and you're just like getting after it, you know, just getting huge. That, yeah. that was what you want to do. And then and then some guys would, would run, some guys would do like triathlons or, or stuff like that. But uh, for the most part, it was just like get in there. And it wasn't even like deadlifts, wasn't even that sort of a thing. It was just, Bodybuilding. yes, yeah. it was bodybuilding and then running like that's it maybe throw a swim in there you yeah. know every now and again but that was pretty much what it was and then I think I started to notice the shift when uh and I don't know if it was just the private sector that uh was just evolving and September 11th happened to throw, toss us into combat which we hadn't really been in sustained combat operations since Vietnam mm -hmm. um you know, we had flashpoints at certain places like Grenada Panama, and Mogadishu, but we hadn't been in sustained combat operations since Vietnam. Um, so I don't know if it was the uh, uh, you know, technology and people just focused on the uh, on fitness in general and nutrition and sleep and functional fitness, all these things, or if it was like, hey, we're in combat now, and guess what? At 10,000 feet in the mountains of Afghanistan with this 100-pound pack on my back, um, guess what? That The buys that I did, the other, it's not really there's better things we can do. So I'm not sure exactly, yeah. you know, what what did what, but it all happened to kind of coalesce around 2001, 2002, 2003 timeframe where people started to really look at, okay, let's work out, not to look good in front of the mirror, but so we can do our jobs better. And it yeah, seems like a strange better. thing to say, yeah. but we thought back in the day, like in the 80s, you thought yeah. that this was gonna help yeah. you do, yeah, thought that yeah. that was gonna help you, you know, be in shape for whatever, for life. Yeah. And that really, when you started, you know, going, working at these high altitudes and going over compound walls and through windows and then dragging people or, you know, doing all these things, it wasn't, it didn't really work mm -hmm. out that way. There were better things to do. And of course, you know, CrossFit hits around at that same time. Yeah. People start becoming more more aware of this thing called functional, functional fitness. Um, and then it took, gosh, I want to say a few more years until we actually hired people at the team. So it didn't just become like a guy in your platoon who's like, hey, you know what we should do yeah. is uh, maybe we should do this, 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 and this to get ready for, for a deployment um, where it kind of became something that uh, the community did and embraced as a whole. And we started bringing people in who had come from professional sports, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of a background. And we brought some really amazing people in um, that uh, at first I think they came into more like the rehab side. This is, and this is just my perspective. Other teams, other, other people might have totally different experience, but the way I saw it happen was that they came in on the rehab side first and then, mm -hmm. so you go to surgery and then, hey, well, let's, let's do some prehab stuff. Let's get you ready for your surgery. And then after your surgery, you're coming back in here and we're going to get you back ready to go out and fight. Um, and so that's kind of where that focus was, I think, in my perspective. And then it kind of grew from there. It became, hey, it's not just for rehab and guys that are going in for surgeries and getting guys back in shape. It's, we need to be ready to, to fight and take some of these lessons and some of these best practices and things that we're learning from professional sports or, or whatever else uh, and put them into programs that prepare our guys for battle mm -hmm. so they can do the jobs to the best of their ability. Um, and so then it started to really grow. We started to put in money into the actual gyms and facilities uh, and get some good good equipment and then get trainers in there that could teach you how to do an actual like a deadlift properly yeah. and then you know set up individual programs if you're if you need to work on something in specifically. Yeah exactly like you're really fast but you can't lift anything. Like if I need to lift a 55 horsepower engine you're not the guy to do yeah. it. Um, so uh, so we, we it, they, so they started tailoring the programs to the individual also. Mm -hmm. So rather than just, hey, there were programs for, hey, your platoon, kind of to get you ready to go, your troop getting you ready to go, but then also to the individual, what yeah. you needed to work on as an individual. And they could keep track of it all so that you could, uh, you know, track hey, your per percentage of body weight here, the and, your, and then you can figure out, you can see your gains over time. So we need to work on 
over time. So they got really good really at that. Exactly, exactly. But it didn't come until you know, a year or two after September 11th. And then I think it's been getting better and better ever since. But there's another side to that too, is, which is interesting, is that uh, you know, back in, in, let's say 2001, time frame um when we had that little just gym on the beach and you were just getting after it doing what you could and then to have these these amazing gyms built up like you'd find in a a professional sports team or something Mm -hmm. like that um it's it's i don't know how to exactly frame it but there was a a difference it's kind of like you know rocky four out in siberia you know and he's out there in the snow and he's like throwing rocks and stuff like that and then you have ivan drago you know with all the technical stuff so there's a i don't know there's exactly so there's a little difference maybe it's an entitlement piece or maybe it's i don't know but there's something to say about uh you know not having everything handed to you and having to go find it yourself and get after it um or then then walking into something that's just amazing like a recruited for professional sports team and you walk in and it's just it's just awesome um you know that's that's great but uh but there was something about just being hungry kind of like a startup like a garage startup, you know, you're doing it, you're hungry, you're just getting after it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's there's something there's something to that. So um, for whatever that's for whatever that's worth. But the point being, we evolved over time and we got a lot better about tailoring pre-deployment workups and pre-deployment uh, functional fitness regimens to uh, the individual, to the troop, to the platoon um, uh, for where they were going to go and what they were going to do. But uh, um, and I'm sure it continues to evolve to this day. Did you notice it starting to make an impact operationally? Were you guys feeling better, performing better? Yes, yeah, yeah. there's no doubt about that. Um, you could definitely tell the difference between when we started to, to evolve and, and before that. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, yeah, there's some gigantic guys that you want to carry that 55 horsepower engine off the beach. Um, and then there were guys that, uh, you, that, that, that couldn't do that or there were guys that were just always hurt. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and, it, and how are they going to get back? How are they going to? get past that injury yeah. um well before we started to evolve they just had to tough it out yeah. there was nothing there was nothing nothing for them so they had to really figure it out on their own uh and there wasn't much sympathy uh from from the rest of the platoon about people that couldn't carry their weight yeah. uh if, if that makes sense um so so to get kind of guys build up this resiliency to injury because you're going to get hurt you are going to get hurt in this mm-hmm. job um so to build up that resiliency ahead of time um and you know you hope from the process of going through buds that you have that that uh, that mental toughness you have that uh, that mental that fortitude yeah. um, and, and that sort of a thing but um, uh, but to to get guys build up this resiliency and hope, hopefully have that resiliency because you went through hell week and you did all these other things but um, to build up that physical kind of resiliency um, in a way that was smart and made sense so that you are preventing some of these injuries because you can have this guy who's trained as a sniper and he's a free fall person and he's awesome and he's a leader and all those things. And then all of a sudden before deployment, he gets hurt because he didn't have, they didn't really build up this resiliency for, mm-hmm. um, for your, your physical, for your body ahead of time. So I think now we're a lot smarter about that. We realize, hey, you have to put this time, energy, effort, and funding into building up that resiliency in these guys um, because otherwise they, they you just invested all this time and now that person's not going on deployment because they're hurt because they you know something happened on a on a on the obstacle course they ran the Friday before they were supposed to leave yeah. and had they been built up ahead of time uh, to be prepared for their body to take this kind of abuse yeah. then you know they'd be going on deployment and they wouldn't be yeah. hurt they wouldn't be going in for surgery yeah. um, so so we're getting a lot we got a lot smarter over my 20 years in the teams that's great. Yeah, when we were developing this program, the guys we were working with, a huge thing that they talked about was, of course, they want to, they want to be like the optimal hybrid athlete, so extremely strong but extremely fast, um, also extremely mobile, need to be able to move quickly. But the thing they brought up more than anything was career longevity. None of them, not a single one of them wants to lose their spot for some silly injury. Mm-hmm. And so exactly. they want to be functionally strong so that they can keep that career for 20 years and not go out with an injury. Exactly. And that helps them when they get out too, because you do 20 years, or let's say you do, you do 15 in your last five, if you're doing 20, you're just kind of broken. Mm-hmm. And maybe you're in a training command and that happens. I think it still happens a lot, maybe not as much um, because we got smarter about building building these guys up ahead of time. But that's certainly something to think about is, uh, is 
is uh, that, that physical longevity both in the teams and out because yeah. um, you're contributing uh, while you're in and you can contribute a lot more obviously if you're not totally broken down uh, and then when you get out too you have another life to live when you turn that page and you yeah. get out and you have to uh, you want to go on a hike with your family or you want to do you know whatever it might be going forward um, but you have to be prepared for life and if you the navy just kicks you to the side uh, broken as you get out which happens quite a bit or used to happen quite a bit I should say uh, I don't know how it is how it is now um, they let one of my friends get out with a broken neck you know um, and uh, so he had to go get some surgery on the on the side on his own, and uh, it's just yeah. So you know, once you're once you're not, but you know, hey, it's the military. They're not uh, they're focused on on you while you're in, um, and it's kind of like a, kind of a nice thing, nice to have mm -hmm. that that also helps when you get out um, because you, your body's a little more resilient. You're not yeah. getting out totally broken, yeah. and your options aren't so limited. Maybe you're not in just all this intense pain all the time. But there's a lot of guys that have to deal with that. They're in pain constantly, and uh, uh, you know they turn to uh, you know, the medication, the prescription drugs. Uh, you're already on Ambien because you've yeah. been overseas, and you're on these crazy sleep cycle type deals. You throw a little alcohol in there. You throw some marital problems in there. You know it's this crazy caustic cocktail you have Vicious. to deal with. So, yeah. um, but being in shape and not having to be, uh, not being in, in pain from these injuries constantly. Um, that just a career that is that uh, where you take the time to build up that resiliency and do it super smart mm -hmm. uh, rather than just, okay, we're going to go, oh, we're all going to go deadlift 500 pounds as part of this workout. Go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. chase. Um, where we're doing things a little, a little smarter seems to, seems to make sense anyway for being while you're in and as you transition out. Yeah. It can change the trajectory of your life, especially when you bring in the factors of like painkillers and mm -hmm. trauma after. Oh, exactly. Yep. Exactly. I feel so fortunate. I have a I did uh, a couple of different surgeries, but one was spine surgery um, near when I near when I got out. And so every morning when I wake up and I'm like, you know, it hurts, whatever. I'm like, I am so glad. I'm so fortunate that that's all I have yeah. because so many guys are dealing with so much more than that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm think I think the guys missing arms and legs, dealing with traumatic brain injury, uh, dealing with uh, post traumatic stress, you know, all of those things. Uh, so I'm like, hey, if I if I got out with just this, I'm good. Yeah, yeah. But when you were when you were in, was each team guy picking their own training plan and going with it? Or were you guys going through it together? Uh, it depended on the, the time frame and the team, your coast, uh, a whole bunch of, of different factors. Um, and I think it, it morphed over time. So they really tried to get everybody doing it, going through together. But then you have you have a box of training where you're going out to the desert and you're spending a month out in the desert and you're just going the entire time doing land warfare stuff. So it kind of falls off. Um, and then you come, you come back. So they really had to look at the training schedule for each individual troop platoon uh, and figure out the best way to incorporate this in there. Because once you're out, when you're out in the desert for yeah. a month running, doing these things, I mean, you are going uh, all, day. <laughs> all day, all night. Yeah, because yeah, you're working at night, you're working during the day. Um, it's crazy. The temperatures are insane. Either they're super freezing or they're boiling hot. You know, there's just so much going on. Um, um, so there's not time to, hey, if we're gonna do an hour and a half in the morning or an hour or even a half hour um, because you're training. You're doing the training for the job. We're not doing the resiliency type training stuff or building, building you up. Um, but then when you get back, maybe you have a week. But then during that week, guess what do you have to do? You have to do X, Y, Z. Guys are all over the place doing different things. So it's really tough to, to keep guys on a program as a group because mm -hmm. so you have to do so many different things once you're back in garrison. So it is it is definitely tougher to do than one would imagine just looking at it at the outset. Um, so point being is that it was different depending on the platoon, depending on the person, depending on who was in charge, and it's kind of morphed over time. I mean, ideally you'd want everybody going through do something together and help build camaraderie at the same time and getting everybody ready to go overseas. You're kind of getting the same same inputs, um, but that wasn't really how it worked. Just the schedules are so insane. So, um, so a lot of it did end up being more individual individualized. Um, and for, for guys that wanted to, to, to really embrace it, then they could. They could make the time to go in there and, and uh, go and work with these guys who are coming from professional sports teams, and they could really stay on top of all that. Mm -hmm. um, but other guys, hey, during that month of training out there in the desert, guess what? Someone's going to get hurt. Uh, and when they get back, what are they going to do? They're going to have to go to medical, and then they're going to have to do this. Yeah, so yeah. it's like, so it's a little bit a little bit crazy. So you really had to embrace it as an individual, even though ideally 
Uh, and in some things you would go through as a platoon, as a troop, they'd take a week and they'd send you to some place and you'd go and you'd do all the uh, VO2 max stuff and you'd get these personalized programs and, and all that sort of thing, which was, which was great. Uh, but, uh, but a lot of times uh, that, that didn't happen because there's just so much on the plate. Yeah, take ownership of kind of your own fitness. Exactly, yeah. a, lot of it, a lot of it did really come down to that. And what about overseas? Is it was it hard to keep up? Dep depending on where you were and what you what you did. Uh, so there were certain times that uh, like I got in the best shape of my life on a couple deployments, yeah. and then on another couple deployments, it was we're just go go go. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess what's good about being downrange is that some of the things that you have to do. Uh, fall off your plate, like some of the family obligations or some of the administrative type things. Um, you're a little farther away from the flagpole, so you don't have to do certain things. So, so oftentimes on deployments, guys got in really good shape. Um, and yeah, a couple of those deployments, I got in the best shape of my life for sure, just crushing. Um, yeah. Because I wasn't worried about having to, you know, go home for to this or that. You're solely focused on the task at hand, on the mission. Um, you kind of have a, a battle rhythm mm -hmm. where you're waking up, and this is different for everybody because sometimes you're in an outstation and you're, it, it, it's totally different. But uh, you can have a battle rhythm where you wake up and that's that's plugged into to your day for like six months, um, and you're gonna have a certain time where you're gonna go in and you're gonna talk to, to Intel and you're gonna see what uh, what's on the on the, the plate for that night and you're going to look at it and say okay we have to wait for this trigger or that trigger or whatever it is and you kind of you know this battle rhythm um and part of that day is okay now i'm, now I'm going to go and uh, and get after it yeah. for a little bit i don't have to do i don't have to go sit down with the commanding officer i don't have to go uh to you know dental to get something checked off or i'm not going to be able to deploy like there's none of that stuff um so you focus on the mission and as part of that mission you want to stay in shape for it so half hour out of your day 45 minutes out of your day hour out of your day is working out um but it's still a, a lot of that is individual as well but now we have the tools that's mm -hmm. the important part now things have evolved to the point where hey you know that week that we spent with that that company that gave us our vo2 max and gave us the heart rate monitors and gave us these workouts uh, well now you have that even mm -hmm. if you're doing it individually depending on how your day is going then you can Here's work exactly on that and you know what to do what you have to work on and instead of just like uh okay it's back day yeah you know i'm gonna work on my work on work on my calves today yeah. you know like it's not that yeah that kind of went by the wayside so point being now these guys have the tools um, uh, to utilize downrange to continue building up that resiliency to stay in shape so that when you throw on the body armor and you have your M4 and you're going over the compound wall, mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're built to do yeah. that. That's awesome. And did you do anything special to prepare for BUDS? Yeah, because I was about as prepared for BUDS as you can possibly be, I think. Um, I'd been studying it my whole life from, let's say, 1980, 81. I knew what I wanted to do. Um, so I was, I was very focused on that. And uh, you know, I would come home from school, and we had this like little uh, like tree fort in the backyard, and I'd be doing pull-ups, you know. And back then, like weighing next to nothing at age like 12, 13, 14, you know, I could like knock out 25, you know, boom. Were then, you training at 12, 13, 14? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I knew exactly where I wanted to go. There were a few, couple of videos back then uh, in the early 80s that you could track down that showed people running an obstacle course uh -huh. um, and then some footage from Vietnam. So I looked at the obstacle course and uh, then I obviously looked at what the guys were doing in Vietnam and then I had a couple books that had photos in there uh, and anything that came out on SEALs, I would snatch it up immediately. My mom was a librarian, um, and so I was, uh, we were surrounded by books, so it was very natural. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have to be like, how do I find this stuff? No, I could go to the library, bookstore, like that was just a natural part of our lives. Uh, Soldier of Fortune magazine, of course, and then some spinoffs like Gung Ho. You could go to Pollard and Press in there in the <laughs> back. There were, so there were ways to get things. Uh, it wasn't like the internet. Yeah. So I had to figure it out kind of on my own. I said, oh, look at someone is climbing a cargo net. Oh, I'm gonna have to do that when I go to Buds. Um, and even back at age 12, they're 13, whatever, I'm thinking about this. Um, and then I'd see them doing like uh, stuff like across the monkey bars and the spider wall and looking at all these things. And so even though I didn't put it in terms of fun functional fitness, um, you know, that's what it, essentially it was. And of course I'm watching Rocky movies back then, I'm all fired up, uh, but I gotta go into the basketball hoop, not the hoop side, but the stuff that attaches it underneath. So I was like, you know, pull, doing this stuff, I was doing different grips, like all that sort of a stuff. I would climb ropes in the backyard because I saw people climbing ropes on obstacle courses. Uh, and then you'd see it in some movies also, obviously. So I tried to do what I thought would prepare me for buds. We had a really steep hill. So I do sprints on that hill, come back, jump under the basketball hoop, do the pull-ups there, um, then climb under the roof of the house. I had my 
bow up there and I'd shoot down like at an angle with my bow back then. Um, yeah, climb up, do the rope climbs in the trees, had r- rappel out of the trees, like uh, rappel down our chimney. Like I was just kind of teaching myself how to do all this stuff and doing it. So, um, and then that evolved a little bit over time as I got a little older and got some weights. Um, of course, back then it was like, two little 10 pounders or whatever. Yeah. And I'm doing like, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, that's what you do when you're a kid. You don't know, there's no yeah. internet. You can't figure any of this, you know, you're just doing what you think you're, you know, you're supposed to do. No YouTube. Um, yeah, no YouTube, nothing like that. So you're doing push ups. you know, you're doing sit ups and uh, doing some pull ups and doing some sprints and doing some rope climbs. And, you know, back then that was, uh, that was pretty good. Uh, and then as I got a little older, of course, 16, 17, 18, 19, and um, then you get a little more, a little more sophisticated, but this is still, you know, early 90s, mid 90s. How so old were you when you went? Uh, I was 21 when I went in, you know. Um, but, uh, but I felt about as prepared as one could be. Like it wasn't a surprise that I'm gonna be cold, wet, tired, and hungry for this thing called Hell Week. Yeah. Like that, that but it was not a shock. You knew it was coming. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, you can prepare yourself only so much mentally for that, but what I did is I thought of all the people who died to give me the opportunity to follow my dream. Mm-hmm. So I thought of the guys going over the beach at Iwo Jima, Normandy, and I'm like, okay, it's Tuesday night of Hell Week. I'm in this freezing cold water. Uh, people are quitting in droves, but guess what? I'm not crossing the beach um, uh, over this open terrain mm-hmm. into a hail of machine gun bullets from somebody that's set up in an elevated position and has me in their sights. Yeah. And people died there so that I could be doing this. And I was like, oh, okay, I can do this for another hour. I can do this for another couple hours, I'm fine. I can... So I, I, I looked at it and I put it in perspective, um, which I think really helped on the mental side of the house. And then physically, for something like that, you're, you know, any average high school athlete can make it through buds physically, mm-hmm. no question. Um, I, see, I saw some guys in the greatest shape quit first hour of Hell Week, and that just fired me up. The mental. Yeah, that just yeah. fired me up, because I'd studied this for so long that I was like, and I'd hear, this is probably terrible to say, but um, I, some of the people in the class would be like locked arms in the surf zone, and those waves are coming over, and people are getting up to quit, and other people in the class would be like, don't quit, don't do it, quit. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> like, if that guy's going to quit, yeah. there's a reason. Yeah. Like, that this program's working. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, this is this is what it's supposed to do. Mm-hmm. Like if you get up to go quit, you know, see ya. Yeah. Uh, which is terrible to say, I guess. But hey, I was I, so I looked at it as a program is working. I put things in perspective, thinking about things that were so much more difficult that other people had done over time um, that allowed me to just get yelled at on the beach for uh, for six months of buds, mm-hmm. uh, but particularly for that week of, of Hell Week. But uh, but physically, any average high school athlete can make it through that. It's the, the mental aspect, obviously, that's the that's the most important and really, really weeds you out. When you evolved into the later part of your career, was there certain things you saw that really helped guys become more mentally tough? Or do you think they just had it or they didn't have it? Yeah, it's tough, that's a, I'm not sure. Um, I think you, I kind of think you either have it or you don't, but uh, and then you get you get tested throughout life, uh, and it's not just the SEAL team, it's not just the military. Like life is definitely going to put you down. Like you're going to get hit, you're going to get hit hard, um, and uh, you know life is about how you deal with that. Um, and the military, you just you're just choosing, like in Hell Week, to get hit. Yeah. Uh, you're choosing to go in the military, knowing that you're gonna you're gonna get hit because uh, it's a test. You're it's a crucible. Mm-hmm. And you're putting yourself in this in this test, but guess what else is a crucible? Life, yeah. like you are gonna get hit and you're gonna get knocked down. Uh, so don't let it be a surprise when it happens. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Um, so uh, so over time, I guess you know I don't know. If, I guess I'd say very few people made it through buds, and then also um, you know combat's a different deal because it's real. And I guess you know you hear stories. People, some people would go and you know uh, kind of get out when it got real, you know, that's another test right there. So, okay, you know, thank you mm-hmm. for, for getting out or for going to like a, a unit somewhere where you're not gonna deploy um, and kind of helping administratively because um, maybe you're not cut out for this. Maybe this isn't your sport, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm glad that you recognize that and are, are moving on and uh, you're not putting everybody else in danger by coming down because you feel guilted into it or whatever it, it might be. But, um, uh, but yeah, I think that resiliency just builds up over time and there's not something specific. You know, they did, they did start doing some things, especially after they realized that, hey, this combat is affecting people uh, physically, uh, 
mentally, emotionally, spiritually even. Um, maybe we need to do some things to take care of these guys. So we started doing these stops on the way home. I forget what they were called right now, but you'd stop in Germany and they'd have uh, some people there you could talk to if you needed to, kind of kind of reacclimatize you to, I think I only did one of them in all my deployments. Um, one of them, like to the 2006, I was in Baghdad one night, and then I think it was like 40 some hours later, I'm home, like changing my first diaper. Um, <laughs> and uh, that was kind of crazy. We stopped in, I think we flew from Baghdad maybe to Spain, I think, and then and then home to the East Coast. So, I th so it was very short layover it's for crew rest, shot. I think. Some, some, yeah, so that, that was interesting. So they, so everybody was doing that. And then they were like, you know what, we need to have these, these rest stops, or they had another name for it, but uh, we'll stop. They'll take three or three, maybe even four days, uh, take a breath, uh, stay in a whatever, in a hotel. No, uh, you're not gonna get hit with an RPG. Your mortar's not coming over the wall. You'll be able to take a breath, get back on a good sleep schedule. Mm -hmm. That way people here to, to help if you need to talk to, to anybody. And you kind of just take a breath before you get thrown right back in the, in the mix at home. So they started doing that. And I guess it was good, but then I think we, guys just started using it as a as a uh, as time to unwind and just for, get crazy, <laughs> and then like shit. yeah, so I don't know, but uh, but so, something along those lines is probably is probably helpful, um, but uh, yeah, resiliency wise, mental toughness wise, yeah, you're going into combat and you're coming home, and I think just naturally you're that's just once again part of life, whether you're in the military or not. Like if you didn't go to combat, guess what? On the home front, you're gonna get hit somehow. Mm -hmm. Don't know what it is, but something's gonna happen. Um, and same thing same thing in combat. So both home front and uh, um, uh, for, for citizens that aren't in the military and then for people in the military, it's just life in general. Like you're gonna have things that are gonna test you and that you're gonna either, that are gonna make you stronger going forward, even though they are very difficult to get through in the moment, mm -hmm. but going forward, that is gonna help you be a stronger, more resilient person and you can pass lessons on to the next generation to hopefully make us all stronger as a whole yeah. going forward. That would be ideal. Just expect adversity. Yeah, I mean, it's coming. It's coming. Mm -hmm. yeah. No matter what, no matter what you do, adversity is coming. Um, last question I had for you today, just wrapping things up. Um, I was curious, when did, when did your passion for hunting start? When did you get into that? Um, how has that helped you you know, just be a better man. Is this something that you dove in later in life or early in life? Yeah, so I was always always drawn to it early in life. And I'd see uh, my friends going off and, and hunting and, and we shot in our house. So we would go to the range and shoot and that sort of a thing. But we didn't we didn't hunt growing up, but I was always drawn to it. Just like I was drawn to the, the military. Um, like it was a calling to join the military. It's, it's a calling to hunt. It's a calling to um, be prepared to defend my family if need, if need be. Like those are just natural things to me. Mm -hmm. uh, so even though I wasn't actively hunting growing up, um, I was thinking about it and I was drawn to it. And just my family, we would go backpacking, you know, this year, we'd go river rafting, we would go rock climbing, we would do that, that sort of a thing. Um, mountaineering, like we were outside, but we just, it wasn't with a rifle. Yeah. But I was out, on all of those things. I was like, man, I wish I had a rifle or a bow. And I remember we were going, my dad and I were going into, um, uh, into the Sierras uh, from the Eastern side and I think I was 10 and we were going in, it was raining and this guy was coming out and he was in the uh, woodland, just cotton, whatever, in the rain. Um, but he was in just this, he was, he was soaking wet and he was in military woodland camis mm. and his face was painted and he had a bow. Oh. And I was like, <laughs> I'm like, that's my, that, that's my guy. Yeah. Like, that's what I want to do yeah. right there. And I was just drawn to that. But see him coming out, and he didn't have a pack on. I remember to this day. I mean, that's been a long time, 1984. Anyway, um, uh, he didn't have a pack, just a bow, uh, but he was all painted up. And yeah. it was, yeah, it was in raining, so all the, you know, it was dark. Uh, so that camo was, was dark. And I remember him coming out on the trail, and we were going in uh, with our backpacks, you know, bright red backpack, you know, whatever, going in. Kelty, like Kelty external frame pack, I remember. <laughs> um, and I was like, oh, man, that is awesome. Of course, he was at the, the Marine Corps Mountain Warfare Center, training center, which is which is there kind of in the on that mm -hmm. eastern side of the Sierras. Um, and uh, so I, he, I'm pretty sure, anyway, that he was attached there somehow. Probably a day um, off. So, yeah, hunting. exactly, exactly. So uh, my first uh, 
I quote unquote real hunt that I think of as my real hunt is uh, part of sniper sustainment training. So early on in the SEAL teams, I went to sniper school and then they started doing this sniper sustainment training rather than just uh, going to a range and, and shooting after you went to sniper school. Um, they wanted to continue to develop your skills. And back then it was really skills that were based on the Vietnam experience. So working with a, a spotter um, and uh, working, in, working in pairs, traveling, finding your target, like just like you would read about in Vietnam, like a Carlos Hathcock type of a, a scenario mm -hmm. um, that evolved very quickly after September 11th and things became different when you started going in with sniper teams in an urban environment and, and all that sort of a sort of a, a thing. But as part of that, we went to a place, and I won't say the name of it because I don't think they, they advertise it, but it's in Washington State, and uh, it was awesome. It was first, uh, my first hunt, um, awesome, 300 wind mag, uh, got my first deer up there, we were hanging in the tree and slicing off pieces and then grilling it. And yeah. I was like so fired up, brought my cooler back with it. My wife was not as thrilled, but now, <laughs> now she is, now she hunts and now we all go out together as a family. And uh, for a long time, all we ate was wild game. Yeah. Um, you know, now people like send steaks and stuff like that. Uh, so we do, we do eat more. Uh, things that uh, we didn't kill yeah. uh, these days. But for a while there, for a good five years, like all we oh, ate wild was wild game, yeah. That's awesome. Um, and my, my daughter naturally gravitated to it early early on, so she got her first year uh, at age seven. Um, we've been to Africa together as a family. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's, it, we put away the phone, not just the kids, but myself as well, mm -hmm. uh, going to places where there's no Wi-Fi, no cell service. We try to get into River Canyon every year for a river trip, and we try to get out on a couple hunts together every year as well, uh, just because there's no option for, well, for the kids to be tied to it. And then for me, too, to be like, oh, hold on, I just have to return this real quick. Oh, hold yeah. on one second. Yeah. Like, that's not even an option. Yeah. Like, it doesn't exist. Uh, but I have to f make time. I have to put that in. And uh, and hunting helps uh, on that front as well. But obviously, it, it's, uh, you know, the responsibility with the, with the safety with your weapon system and that self-reliance and that attachment to the land, that appreciation for the animal and everything that it took to get this animal down as far as training. Yeah. Uh, and then everything else that prepared you to get in the right spot to make your one shot and put that animal down and then take care of it in the field and then bring it home and yeah. then cook it up and then remember that hunt and that animal um, rather than just go to the store and grab something that's wrapped in cellophane mm -hmm. and look at it and be like oh this is more expensive now and throw it in your cart yeah like there's just such a there's just uh, people are so disconnected from the land and the animals that inhabit it now and that was not something that you could have done for most of human history. Yeah. Like if you were gonna survive, you had to be connected to the land, you had to be connected to the animals, you had to know how to defend yourself and your family and your tribe. Um, only very recently have we been able to outsource that like by calling 911 no or way. outsource that by going to the grocery store. Yeah. Just the slimmest portion of human history. Um, yet that disconnection from the land really impacts all of society, I think. So for, for us as a family, it's very important to get out there and for our kids to have an appreciation for the land and the animals um, and uh, and realize that, hey, this this steak out of my plate or this the, the meat in this spaghetti uh, sauce, mm -hmm. like that came from an actual you know, living, breathing animal that, uh, that somebody put down at yep. some point and worked to get here on my plate. Yep. Um, so so that, that appreciation, I think, is uh, incredibly important and is lost in many segments of society today. Mm -hmm. But um, but point being, after that, that hunt, September 11th happened not so long after that, and the hunting kind of shifted, obviously, to mm -hmm. hunting of people. But there was so many similarities uh, in establishing a pattern of life on a target downrange. Same mm -hmm. thing, like you have a trail camera, you want to know where Deers are, you know, wherever they're going. Um, so there's a lot of similarities between uh, understanding an animal Move that you're hunting and the pattern, but yeah, their patterns and you know where they're where they are, where they were, where you're going to find them, where the winds are. Like so many because you're studying that animal um, yeah. and their and their patterns, and then same thing downrange, you're studying another type of animal yeah. and their patterns um, and where are they going to be and what's that trigger for them and all all the rest of it. So a lot a lot of similarities there, and I wove that into Savage Sun in my third book, mm -hmm. a lot of that stuff into into that. Um, but uh, but then we yeah started hunting as a family, especially when my daughter expressed interest without any input from me uh, awesome. that she wanted to go out and hunt, and so we became a we became a hunting family and started getting getting out there at every opportunity. And now um, all of us hunt together and we try to get out there a couple times a year. I have a hunting operation in Lanai, Hawaii called Pineapple Brothers out yeah. there. So you, uh, you go to Lanai, Hawaii, access deer, mouflon sheep out there. And uh, we're heading out there actually next month. But, uh, but it's just a part of our, of our lives now. And I can't imagine it, it not being a part of our lives. That's great. That's phenomenal. 
And also it helps me stay in shape. I mean, yeah. I, need, I know I need to get back after it. I've been doing a lot more typing than I've been doing working out these days. But, uh, but now it's more about being prepared for life rather than being prepared to go to Iraq, being prepared to go to Afghanistan and do that job. Yeah. Well, hey, now I'm looking at that resiliency and that, uh, that long-term fitness so that I can play with, uh, play with the kids, that I can uh, yeah, the, the, get out there and throw the lacrosse ball with them and then so we can go hunting together and I'm not like just sucking wind way back on the trail and I'm like, they're looking at me like, Dad, come on, keep up. So now I have other reasons to, to stay, in, stay in shape or get back in, back in shape, but that hunting obviously helps with that because when we go into the mountains after elk or whatever it is, you know, I want to, oh, yeah. I, I, I don't want to be the weak link, you know, and I got to be a good example for the kids and just be prepared for, for life in general. So, um, so now, uh, rather than training for, for war, training for the hunt or training yeah. for, for life in yeah. general. Exactly. We just got to fix that squat form so you can ski. Oh, that squat form has not, like all those people I talked about that came in from professional sports teams, yeah. like one of their, one of their main jobs was to teach us how to do these lifts correctly. I am hopeless when it comes <laughs> to my form in squats. Like it's just, I'm just not built for, I'm built for like running long distances, putting that pack on and going. Yeah. But for whatever reason, like that, I have to work around not being able to squat. Like it's just, it's something I've accepted. <laughs> like, like it's important to know your capabilities and your limitations yeah. in life in general. Uh, so you can work on certain things, um, but like let's say with a sniper weapon system uh, or just with a, a rifle, rifle scope, reticle, ammo combo. Uh, you wanna know your capabilities yeah. with that combination uh, and your limitations. So the first time you're like, oh, I think I can get that elk at X distance. Um, well, you know. Yeah. You know that, hey, I, nah, I, I'm, only, I'm more of like a 150-yard yeah. shot person in these winds and in these conditions and this angle. And you know that because you spent time with this rifle, scope, reticle, ammo combo yeah. in a bunch of different conditions, environmental conditions. Uh, and you, you know exactly what your capability is and your limitation. Yeah. So you're not wounding that animal and then off it goes and you're like, oh man, here we go. And, mm -hmm. um, like, like you, that animal deserves that. Yeah. It deserve, it, uh, you owe that to the animal and to your, to your family that's looking to you as an example yeah. um, to put that requisite time, energy, and effort into understanding your weapon system so that when you get out there and you're at the, you know, about to take that shot, you can say, no, I know that, exactly. Yeah. Uh, we need to move in another hundred yards, yeah. or I need to get down a little, whatever it might be, yeah. depending on the person and what they've chosen uh, for their weapon system. But uh, but it's important to know yeah. capabilities and limitations. So I know my limitations when it comes to the squat. <laughs> we got to get you on the the plate squat. Jimmy, our head trainer, has us all on these plate squats now, where you just elevate your heels on the back, just on a 25 pound plate. Okay. So it just brings your heels up like two or three inches. Okay. But it gives you full range of motion, uh, which is nice because most people, even like myself, don't have great squat form because of ankle mobility. Okay. So your ankle won't clear, but that plate brings it up. So now we do them all the time and it's phenomenal. All right, when well, we get my gym yeah. set up, I'll do it, I'll video it, I'll send it to you. Yeah. And then you can be like, oh. <laughs> Man, you'll see, you'll see. Like, I, I'm not hopeful that this 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 play thing is going to work for me, but I'm going to give it a shot. But I'll send it to you, and then you'll be like, oh yeah, he just needs this. Day. Yeah, then we'll. He should just do some kettlebell swings. Yeah, like, let's just keep lot. him on some. Yeah, keep him on some basics. Lost cause. Yeah, exactly. Side. Yeah, yeah. Let's work around that. <laughs> yeah. Here's what I have to work with. Let's make. Uh, let's, yeah, to let's account for that and yeah. uh, and do what we need to do. Uh, it's, it's not going to spend you know, the next 20 years trying to <laughs> get like one degree better at my deadlift. Yeah. And you're going to do the Rocky Gym. Yep, yep, Rocky Gym outside, uh, and just in the snow and the rain. Uh, once again, going back to what we talked about earlier, I think there's something something to that to not having a perfect, pristine yeah. type of uh, type of a setup. But uh, you know, eventually when we build the barn, we'll get some stuff inside, but it'll still be more Rocky esque than uh, than just perfect, sterile. You know, super high end. It'll yeah. be really high end as far as you know. Sornex type stuff and yeah. that, that sort of thing, but all good, solid stuff. But it won't be won't be Ivan Drago. That That's was a very cool. influential movie. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think it came out in 1985. Um, very influential movie yeah. uh, in my in my youth. You know, you'll be Rocky, you don't be Ivan. You know? <laughs> <laughs> There's something so special about that. Like on, we have the nice mountain tough lab, but on the weekends when I'm at home. I'll do basement workouts. So I'll, our basement's freezing. So I'll put on like a hoodie and a beanie and they're like my favorite workouts. Nice. You're just down there, there frozen in the basement. Yeah. And it, 
there's something special about those elements for sure. Yep. No, no, I agree. I agree. But your setup looks awesome. And I'm so fired up for what you guys are doing and you have the app, but I love what you guys are doing. Um, especially for, for somebody like me that, uh, you know, has so much going on and is focused on being able to like move through the back country with weight, pack out an elk, pack out a moose. Yeah. Um, yeah, packing out an elk was like one of the toughest. And I was in shape back when I got my first elk yeah. and, uh, and I had to move that thing a, a couple miles and in multiple trips and public land and it was a lot of meat and that was like i remember as i did that i was thinking i don't think this is as tough as i think it's tougher than hell week it's i remember insane. having that in my in my head because i was at altitude in new mexico and you know it's packed up differently than the perfect like 25 pound weight you put on yeah. a pack or tie into your pack or sandbag you put in that's like perfectly yeah. aligned on your pack like carrying out like a hindquarter that's just not Bulging. exactly yeah. so it's diff it's a different kind of weight yeah. and uh and now that uh that that's you know kind of focused on that um i need to i definitely get ready for for that kind of a uh an endeavor mm -hmm. uh is carrying out something like that packing in packing out multiple trips and uh, and having that weight that's just not perfect mm -hmm. on your back. Yeah, There's like, nothing like it. Yeah, yeah. So it's not like it. things, things in real life. It's not, you know, climbing over a compound wall, you know, isn't just this, yeah. you know, you, have, you need to do more than just this. I mean, it's great to be able to do that, mm -hmm. but also to do the other things that allow you to move with that, with that rifle and with everything else that you have, have yeah. going on. Um, but same thing with packing that, uh, packing that elk out, packing a moose out this, this summer. Luckily we got some horses in fairly close. So I didn't have to go that far. Thank goodness. Yeah. Um, by the start of this fall, but, uh, but being able to, to carry that stuff out and not looking at it like, Oh man, I don't know if I can do this. Mm -hmm. Like, Hey, being confident that, uh, that that you've trained up and prepared enough yep. that, uh, yeah, this is going to be, yeah, I'm going to get some right now, yep. but I'm about as ready as I can be. Yep. So so thank you guys for for doing what what you do. And, uh, man, I'm excited to to, uh, to get get on the program. I'm excited. I'm excited to see you out there in the with the app at the Rocky Gym. That's it. Yep. <laughs> it's it's coming amazing. soon. Coming yeah. soon. And thank you. And we're stoked for the show. Can't wait. It's going to be amazing. It's looking good. It's definitely, definitely looking good. People are going to be surprised at Chris because they've only seen him in, in some of the other other films. Like he gets he gets dark. Yeah, he gets dark. Serious. In this. In this it's, one. Uh, yeah, it's good stuff. That's going to be amazing. Thanks, man. Well, thanks so much. Appreciate your time. Absolutely, absolutely. We'll get hit the, we'll get in the gym soon. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> Take care, man. Thanks, Jack.